this time we have a very special podcast. Today I will be talking with William B. Irwine, professor of philosophy, author of seven books, including A Guide to a Good Life and The Stoic Challenge. Would be Zen Buddhist who finally decided to become a Stoic, inventor of the Stoic Guts. Is everything correct, Bill? Would you like to add anything to your description? That's pretty close to correct. I didn't invent the Stoic gods. I just gave them a modern spin. So I have to have to correct you at that point. And they've become my good friends ever since. Okay, okay. Do do they have some special names? I uh, I haven't gotten around to naming them yet, but I do have uh, conversations with them. It's a one sided conversation. They haven't answered back yet, but I do have conversations with them. Usually, just refer to them in the plural. Uh, you know, when when I'm presented with a particular challenge, then I um, I respond by uh, maybe shaking a fist at them. <laughs> okay. Like saying, Okay, I'm going to show you who's in charge here. <laughs> I understand. Bill, I feel very excited to have the opportunity to talk to my favorite Stoic author on my podcast. Does it reflect poorly on my Stoicism that I feel excitement instead of calmly accepting what fate brought me? I, I would say not. And, you know, there is that concept of the Stoics and uh, who they were and what they did. And it, it's the idea of these very passive individuals who worked hard on developing the ability to just stand there and grimly take whatever life threw at them. And uh, so that's the popular conception, but that's mistaken. And if you look at the actual Stoics themselves, you find that they often, um, well, they, they were opposed to negative emotions. So they thought that if you had a life full of negative emotions, such as anger, hatred, envy, anxiety, that you were doing something wrong. You were, you were following the wrong psychological trajectory. But they had nothing against positive emotions. Uh, positive emotions including uh, delight, including a sense of awe, including even joy. Uh, but, you know, when, when we talk about things and we talk about emotions, <clears throat> there's a difference between saying something is a positive emotion and saying something feels good. Uh, the positive emotions do feel good, but there are things other than positive emotions that also feel good but are very dangerous. For instance, certain drugs, uh, that, that's why people uh, get addicted. So uh, Stoic said a positive emotion, and you know, the, the ones I've named, things like feelings of delight, a sense of delight. Um uh, They feel good, uh, they're a positive emotion, but we can have other things that feel good, but are, we should avoid, the Stoics would have said. Mm -hmm. I want to explore this topic about positive emotions, because to my knowledge, the Stoics valued reason and objectivity. They tried to see the world as it is. Positive emotions, although very pleasant, can disturb this objectivity. For example, in the state of euphoria, I can make very unwise decisions, take a loan, quit a good, good job because I'm dreaming of starting my own business, even though I don't know anything about running business. So is it really the case that every positive emotion is good for Stoics? Um, well, again, a uh, feeling of euphoria is uh, a dangerous thing. So they wouldn't include it among their list of Of positive emotions. It would be a good feeling, but uh, th th they would exclude it. You know, uh, I mean, another way to put it is the Stoics, we think of them as philosophers of the ancient world, but back then, the word philosophy meant something different than it does today. So philosophers were interested in deep questions about morality and about the meaning of life, but they were also interested in science. They were interested in uh, nature Uh, they were interested in theology, so they were just the, the inquisitive, curious people of the ancient world. And one of the things they were interested in, this is the Stoics in particular, is they were interested in human psychology. And um, so I like to think of them as psychological philosophers or philosophers that had one foot in philosophy and the other foot in psychology. And one of the things they discovered is that although we humans, and they aren't alone in discovering this, there are many different cultures 
in which this has become apparent. Although we humans have a capacity for being rational, we also uh, harbor within us the forces of irrationality, uh, including, um, you know, our, our, our reptile brain that reacts um, instinctively and reflexively uh, to what uh, it's, goes on around it. So if you have a moment of anger, a flash of anger, that's the source. And it's not a, a rational response, but it's kind of programmed into us by our evolutionary past. We also have this mammalian brain, which provides us with many of the emotions we experience, and some of the emotions uh, are anything but rational. So uh, if you've ever fallen in love, uh, you know what a dangerous thing that is, but that's just uh, part of the human experience. And I think the Stoic insight was that as a human, we have to learn to live with these uh, instincts, these emotions, these reflexive behaviors. They're, they're going to be happening. And what we have to do is find a way to limit the negative impact they have on our lives. And maybe even, and this is the brilliant part of it, uh, find a way to trick them into serving our rational needs. So if you told me you suddenly got this sudden flash of insight that you need to quit your reliable job and start a business in something um, you don't know about, then uh, as a Stoic, I would say, you know what, you need to give this uh, some more thought because um, you could be having this emotion for any number of semi-rational reasons, and you could be undermining your long-term interests. You know, we have all sorts of things going on psychologically. Uh, uh, One of them is that what feels good now is uh, much more important to us than sacrificing now for something that will feel good in the future, even though it's us that would experience both of those sensations. So uh, imagine, uh, imagine uh, s- sexual relations, for instance. Uh, so uh, I'm a man, uh, I'm a father too, but I've, I've never given birth to a child, but I've been told by good authority that it's pretty close to the most pain a human being can experience. And um, what it's preceded, though, uh, by nine months, <laughs> by some of the greatest pleasure a human being can experience in the form of sexual pleasure. And now suppose you reverse the equation. Suppose you said to somebody, hey, guess what? Have this baby now and experience this incredible uh, uh, pain. And nine months from now, you'll have an orgasm. You'll have Mm -hmm. a very pleasurable orgasm. Nobody would go for that. They'd say, that's just crazy. (laughs) I'm not going to do that. But turn around the timing. And then that's what's kept us... We, we have not only survived on Earth, but we have taken over the planet, we human beings, who have that programming. And another psychological phenomenon is hedonic adaptation. So what you do is you find yourself uh, from minute to minute wanting something and even convincing yourself that if you only had it, that's it. You would be happy forever. You would live happily ever after, as they say in the fairy tales. Uh, but the problem is that once you get the thing, that you thought would complete you, uh, in a very short period of time, you start taking it for granted. And then it no longer is a source of pleasure. And then you have, once again, that feeling like, if only I had something else that would uh, complete me. So we're we're on what what psychologists refer to as a hedonic treadmill. Uh, We we just can't gain any mileage. Um, The Stoics, along with uh, the, the thinkers in many other cultures, realized this. And the Stoics said, uh, if we're sensible people, if we're rational people, one of the things we want to do is get off the hedonic uh, treadmill. And one way to do that is to learn how to appreciate the things we've already got. Uh, sh- shorter way of putting it, want what we already have. Because, you know, if we, if we do that, we're going to be satisfied. We're going to say, you know, the stuff I've already got, it's what I want. And you're going to be a satisfied individual. And if you can't do that, then you're doomed to a lifetime of dissatisfaction when satisfaction is within your grasp. Mm-hmm. Thank you for this insight. I would like to talk also about negative emotions because they are strongly connected to our satisfaction of life. I was uh, studying psychology and my teachers told me that we shouldn't label emotions. According to them, we shouldn't talk about positive and negative emotions because 
all emotions serve us. If particular emotion would only be uh, have a negative impact in our lives, it would probably disappear during the process of evolution. So even anger, which Seneca believes is the worst or most dangerous of all emotions, can be put to good use. My friend, when she is angry, she goes to the wardrobe and get rid of the clothes she doesn't need. In a cold emotional state, she cannot do it. So when she's pissed off, she, she can finally do what she needs. Jealousy can also motivate us to, to work harder. Are you sure that we as Stoics should get rid of all negative emotions in our life or we can use them in some way? Uh, two thoughts. First is we can't get rid of them. Uh, the problem is they're wired into us. They're the parts of our brain, you know, the cortex which is the rational part of our brain, is wrapped around the mammalian part of our brain, which in turn is wrapped around the reptilian part of the brain, the, 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 uh, the brain stem. And here I'm simplif oversimplifying. So we can't get rid of them short of a, a brain surgery that would probably uh, kill us. Uh, and here's another thing to realize when you say that our emotions have served us. Yes, but the problem is we're in a radical radically different environment than we were in when those emotions first developed. So they developed on the savannas of Africa 200,000 years ago. This is our human ancestors. Uh, and they got emotions that would allow them to survive and reproduce. Those are the two key things. If you don't survive, uh, you know, your species dies out. If you don't reproduce, your species dies out. So we acquired emotions that would increase the chance that we would do those two things. But now we're in a radically different environment than they were in the past. We're in an environment where, you know, for them, it was the question of, will there be food to eat today? And, you know, you'd get up at dawn thinking about that and start taking steps in order to get the food that you would need to eat. But now it's just the opposite problem. You know, the problem is the, the obesity epidemic. There's too much to eat and it's the wrong kind of food and it's, and it's everywhere. So um, um, emotions that served us well in that environment are counterproductive in this environment. Uh, physically, we're quite safe compared to our ancestors. You know, the chance of a lion eating you is close to zero. But for them, it was a, it was a concern. Um, so we're in a, this different environment. So emotions that served them, using the word served them, for us can be counterproductive, can uh, make us miserable when we don't need to be miserable. And like I say, we can't get rid of the emotions, but we can learn how better to live with them. And the Stoic insight is we can take advantage, we can manipulate our emotions in a way that will help us get what we want in life. That was the brilliant insight that they had. Mm -hmm. I understand. Thank you. Another question. What is the difference between worrying about the future and applying the premeditatio malorum technique, or as you call it, negative visualization? Um, to worry about the future, <clears throat> well, one thing is uh, we're programmed uh, to think about... Um, primarily about uh, the past and the future. Um, you know, they, they say that one goal of, of uh, should be to live in the present, to enjoy what you've got, to, to uh, smell the flowers, to see the, the blue sky. But we're programmed not to do that. We're programmed to think about what's going to happen next because our ancestors on the savannas of Africa who sat there and smelled the flowers probably got eaten by a lion, you know. It was his lunch. Um, so we're not going to so, – so that didn't pay. Thinking about the past did pay because you could learn lessons from the past that would help you better shape your future. Um, so we've learned to think about the past. Unfortunately, that can quickly devolve into dwelling about past events, thinking about something somebody said 10 years ago that made us angry and letting it make us angry again. And we also – Think about the future. And some such thinking is absolutely appropriate. Stoics said, you know what, we should plan for the future. But in a lot of cases, uh, it goes beyond that. Instead of simply planning for the future, 
experience anxiety about the future. Uh, they worry about what's going to come instead of doing what they can to shape what's going to happen and then say, I've done what I can, and, uh, and then I'll take the consequences that come. Negative visualization is a stoic technique that um, sounds like it could, it, it resembles anxiety, you know, an anxiety attack, except that there's an important difference. So the negative visualization a very simple and easy to use a psychological technique. Now, I told you that the Stoics, we think of them as philosophers, but they were psychologists as well, and they were very practical psychologists. So they weren't just dwelling in the realm of theory. They said, we can come up with some strategies that an ordinary person can quickly learn to use, can put it to work in his or her life, and can change the life in a dramatic fashion. So to practice negative visualization, what you do is take some aspect of your life that's important to you. And it can be your job, it can be your health, it can be a relationship, it can be the fact that you're alive, you name it, something that's important to you. And then, <clears throat> for a few seconds, you concentrate, you visualize the absence of that thing in your life. And so you imagine you know, and things happen in life. And you imagine that something has happened to end the relationship, or you've gotten a, a phone call from your doctor who tells you, you know, that you have some, some terrible disease. You imagine that. And here's the key thing. And then you let go of that thought, and you return to uh, your daily life. You don't dwell on that thought, because that would be a recipe for a miserable existence. What you do is you have a flickering thought about something you take for granted, vanishing from your life. And the interesting thing is you'll discover that afterwards, for a while, you won't be taking the thing for granted. And if you imagine, for instance, that something has happened to a good friend uh, of yours, and then you see that friend again, uh, you're going to take great delight in the fact that they still exist, that they still are part of uh, of your life. Otherwise, uh, relationships are easy to take for granted until until they end, and that's unfortunate. Um, so it's a technique easy to use, quite effective. I found, and I've I've uh, heard from lots of people about it. Uh, qu quite easy for, uh, quite effective in the lives of many people. Uh, sounds like anxiety, but it isn't, because what you're doing is you're consciously having a flickering thought about losing something, and then you're letting the thought go. And in anxiety, you would just have repeated thought about losing something, losing something, and you'd be quite miserable as a result. Okay, great. So we are in control of this process, negative visualization, and we can stop it when we want but worrying, we can worry all the time and we have no control over it. Is that correct? Worrying, you actually can have a greater control. And part of uh, worrying is a failure for you to accept what the, the facts as they are. Uh, so uh, as a Stoic, one of the things you realize and you think about um, not necessarily daily, but almost daily, is you stop to realize um, that uh, there will be a last time for everything you do in life. There will be a last breath you take. There will be a last meal you eat. There will be a last time you ride a bicycle. You go through the list. And in some cases, there already has been the last time you do something in life. When, when was the last time you dialed a rotary telephone, right? Uh, and uh, that's because you're going to die. You're going to die someday. I'm sorry to be the one to break the news to you. Um, and you can either think that that's just the most negative thought you can have and that that's a recipe for depression. But uh, Stoics said, no, just the opposite, in fact. Because if you start taking your life for granted, what you're going to do is waste the days of life that are available to you. They're going to pass by and you're going to be on autopilot. You're just going to be going through the motions. But if you think to yourself... You know, this meal could conceivably be the last meal I eat. There will be one of these. You won't be on autopilot. You will stop and you will savor the, 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 uh, the fact that you could have this meal, the food that's present, the fact that the food is there. 
So you're living life in a much more intense way than if you simply deny death as a possibility. Uh, Same thing is true of relationships. Every relationship in your life will come to an end. Sorry to break the news once again, but that's just because you're not immortal, and the people you know aren't immortal either. So you have two approaches. The standard approach is people start taking relationships for granted. And so when they're with the other person, they don't particularly um, uh, you know, pay attention. They're there. They're kind of half engaged in, in whatever conversations they take uh, place, uh, they, that take place. But you can also, uh, when you have a relationship, if you realize that th- this relationship, uh, while it's part of my life, I, I need to embrace it. The conversations, I need to listen to what the other person is saying. You know, a lot of what passes for conversation is just two people waiting for the other person to stop talking so they can tell them what the truth is. That's what conversation is. Uh, conversation can be much deeper than that, where you... You know, you're asking significant, meaningful questions. You're you're trying to understand the other person better. Uh, you're trying to appreciate the other person. So um, it's paradoxical, I know, but the idea that relationships don't last forever can either be regarded as a really negative thought, or it can be something that vitalizes the relationships that you have, that gets you off of autopilot, that gets you fully engaged in those relationships. Mm -hmm. In your book, you talk a lot about hedonic adaptation, and this is maybe one of the worst enemies for our happiness. So what tools does Stoic give us to fight with this hedonic adaptation. We talked already about negative visualization and thinking about last times. This could be the last time I will do something. Is there any more tools that we can fight this hedonic adaptation? Those are the two uh, primary tools. Um, There are other tools that are kind of connected with that. Uh, One of the things we can do if we just want to appreciate our life in broad terms, you know, not specific things in our life, but uh, uh, the the fact that we're alive um, uh, is we can go out of our way to do things that are going to cause us a a degree of discomfort. Uh, We can go on what I call stoic adventures, uh, where we're consciously going out of our way so that things that we take for granted will be deprived, will be deprived of things that we, we take for uh, for granted. So, uh, for instance, um, if you uh, live a very comfortable existence, if you've got an apartment, if you stay inside, uh, and you, uh, as a lot of people have recently been forced to do, then, uh, you know, you will uh, start taking it all for granted. You'll assume that it has to be that way. Uh, go on a camping trip, uh, go on a, a camping trip to someplace semi-wild, and you will have an adventure uh, in the sense that you will experience all sorts of setbacks that you wouldn't if you just stayed home in your apartment. Now, some people hear that and they say, well, why should I do that? Why would you experience discomfort when you can live a life of complete comfort? Uh, two answers. The first answer is that you can't experience a life of complete comfort, uh, that no one has it in their power, that things can happen. And if all you've ever experienced is comfort, then uh, whatever discomfort you you experience is going to be uh, magnified. Uh, the other thing about it going out of your way to experience discomfort is that you get good at dealing with life setbacks. Um, those setbacks are one of the primary causes of, uh, of a human misery, of, of unhappiness. Uh, everything's going along really well, and then you're set back. Uh, and the striking thing about it is when life sets you back, most times it isn't the setback itself that hurts you. It's your response to the setback, because most people respond to the setback with negative emotions. So they feel uh, angry, they feel uh, upset, they feel a sense of regret, and that's what does the damage. So in um, I've written about this in, in my book, The Stoic Challenge, and I, I compare it to if a water pipe bursts in your house. Uh, what causes the damage? And, uh, you know, the obvious answer is, well, the pipe's broken. You're going to have to get the pipe fixed. 
Uh, and then if you think about it uh, a little bit harder, you realize, well, it isn't the broken pipe. That's pretty easy to fix. It's all the water going all the way over <laughs> things that you don't want to get wet. And if it happens on, on the second floor of your house, then... Um, then it's you know you're going to have ceiling collapses from the water. You're going to have all sorts of. It's going to be such a mess to to clean up, and the, the same is true of life setbacks. The setback itself is probably a minor thing. Uh, if you saw the setback happen to somebody else, you'd say it's just a little thing. But when a setback happens to you. Well, it's not the setback, but if you get angry, if you let the setback make you angry, then it's going to ruin your day. And in the future, you might have anger flashbacks. That's what hurts you. And the stoic insight was you've just got to develop a strategy for preventing life setbacks from causing you to experience negative emotions. And so one way you can do that is by treating them as what I describe as stoic challenges. So... Um, you turn it into a kind of game, and that is when you experience a setback, then you imagine not that life is unfair and you didn't deserve this, but you imagine that uh, you're being tested by these imaginary stoic gods who uh, who have caused the setback um, as a test to you. And then you might think, ah, well, then they're evil. They're in league with the devil that they would do <laughs> such a thing. No, they're, they're, they're like a good coach, you know, a coach on a sporting team. If you've ever been in sports, you'll know that the good coach isn't the one who tells you just how wonderful you are and go over there in the shade and rest. The good coach is the one who finds within you things you didn't even know existed, strength and courage that you didn't know existed. And um, you're going to have to pay a price, a physical price to find those things. When you do, it's some of the most valuable discoveries you can make. So um, th these imaginary stoic gods, they're like uh, a coach trying to toughen you for the activity known as life as a, as a human being. Uh, the tests that they administer, uh, they're self-graded. So the coach isn't going to come and say, okay, here's how you did on that, uh, son. Uh, the coach, instead, it's self-graded. And uh, the grade is depends on two things. First of all, whether you successfully found a workaround for the setback. And that's going to require you to use your reasoning ability. So s pipe breaks. So what do you do next? Well, you know, first you're going to stop the water from leaking, and then you're going to call a plumber, and you're going to go through a list. So that's uh, the first component of the grade. The second component of the grade is, did you keep your cool after the setback? That is, did you stay calm? Uh, did you uh, maybe even make a joke out of it rather than allowing yourself to get angry uh, and upset? And that's actually the more important of the two components, because if you succeed in doing that, you've prevented most of the negative emotions that you would otherwise experience. Uh, so find a workaround and keep your cool while you do it. And you have successfully, you got a good grade on that, uh, on that stoic test. And uh, you can uh, kind of uh, feel pride and let the stoic gods know, hey, I won this one. <laughs> uh, you're going to have to do better than that if, if you want to, uh, if you want to really challenge me. And when they do challenge you, uh, and again, this is one of these paradoxical things, uh, they aren't doing it to punish you. They're doing it because they want you to thrive as a human being. And you know, if you um, approach the world in that way, and that is you, um, instead of avoiding things that are difficult to do, if you find things that are difficult to do just because they're difficult for you to do, uh, what you'll, you'll uh, realize is that you're gaining uh, what I call the two C's, competence and confidence. So you'll get good at finding workarounds to life set, life's setbacks, and that's the competence component. And you will develop your confidence, and that is when you experience a setback, you'll know in the past you've been able to deal with the setbacks you experienced. And so this new setback, yeah, you know. Um, a stoic adventure, climbing uh, Mount Everest would be a stoic adventure. I don't advise it for anyone, <laughs> so don't do this, but it would be... A uh, major example of a stoic adventure, because if you've climbed Mount Everest, you know, and then later in life, 
there's some setback or some challenge or some difficult thing to do and somebody walks up to you and says, okay, well, how about this? Do you think you could do that? Uh, you know in the back of your mind that you climbed Mount Everest. So yeah, you could probably do whatever the thing is if you wanted to. Now, a Stoic would say you don't go around boasting about having climbed Mount Everest. But if you have, you've got that in your back pocket, you know, just as a psychological thing of, yeah, you know, I- I'm pretty good at dealing with uh, setbacks. I have a pretty good track record. So I can go forward in life confident. Mm-hmm. Uh, being cool is for sure very helpful in dealing with setbacks. But what about situation that being emotional, being passionate is needed? For example, in artistic creation, being on the stage, performing in front of the audience, or in the bedroom, being a tender lover. Can we put our stoicism on hold in these situations? Um, I had, uh, 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 well, let's see, I, I have been on, on a stage, but that was back in high school very, very long ago. And the interesting thing is on a stage, I guess, uh, you know, people might be playing a role where they're uh, really sad or really happy. Uh, and I guess they could let it uh, for a time carry over into their own life, uh, you know, and you could be playing uh, death scenes in some play and walk around depressed. But I think most good actors don't. It's a curious thing. So what are they doing? They're uh, they're becoming emotional, but n- not in a deep sense of the word. They're acting. They're acting. Uh, so I recently had, because, let's see, because of the pandemic, I had made travel plans and um, recently canceled those travel plans uh, and, and knew that uh, from the contract that I was entitled to uh, 50% a refund of the uh, deposit I had put down. And, you know, I knew that's fair because I, I was canceling. And um, but the company said that, uh, OK, uh, they would give me the refund, but that there was a long line of people uh, getting refunds and uh, that it might take a while. And uh, they said it could even take up to 90 days. You know, and I said, well, yeah, you know, these are unusual times. So we got to the 90th day, and I called the person who uh, was responsible for the refunds, and I said, well, it's 90 days. And I said, uh, and I'm, I'm worried about the solvency of a uh, travel company, so I want my money back. I want my, half of my, re, uh, my down payment back, and I want it now. And uh, he said, well, let me tell you, it's a really complicated situation, and you're there on the list. And our competitors are now taking 120 days to give people their money back. And then, now my wife was in the other room listening to this, and I uh, let him know in, a, in, uh, in, in no uncertain circumstances that I better get my money quickly, or I would go online and tell people that this was a company that didn't, uh, uh, you know, honor their contracts and so on and so on. And um, then uh, he said he would look into it for me. And then um, my wife walked into the room and said, you got mad at that guy. And I said, no, I didn't. And she said, well, I could, I could hear the things you were saying. And I said, yeah, I was acting. So it's an interesting thing that the Stoics would offer this advice too, that it, if you're angry about something, actually angry, you're mis- making a mistake. But they would add quickly, and this was Seneca who said this, there are times in life when uh, the sensible thing to do is to act as if you're angry, but it's just acting. And that's because there are people who don't understand. You can't reason with them, but they do respond to anger. And so you give them what they respond to. Um, but, you know, I, I assured her that I wasn't at all angry, that I was fine, that even while I was, you know, making these angry uh, k- kinds of uh, pronouncements, that it was acting, and acting that unfortunately, under these circumstances with this uh, particular person, that's what was required to get a down payment back that was owed me. I, I mean, that, that that's an interesting thing. And there would be people who would say, well, it's psychologically unhealthy to, to uh, act uh, your emotions when you could be actually uh, feeling them. Uh, Stoics would say, uh, well, what's really dangerous is the negative emotions, and they can affect uh, 
your health, your lifespan, and so on. Uh, at the same time, the Stoics, as I've said, had nothing against positive emotions, uh, feelings of delight, feelings of love even, right? That that's good. Uh, and that those you allow yourself, uh, you embrace them. So you're not just acting, you're not just pretending uh, the feeling of delight that you're experiencing. Um, so they have this asymmetric relationship with positive and negative emotions. Negative emotions, try to avoid them, but sometimes pretend like you're experiencing them. Positive emotions, when you experience them, you're a very lucky human being. Embrace them. And while you embrace them, keep in mind that they aren't always going to be there for you. So double embrace them because, uh, you know, you're not going to live forever. And you might not find yourself in the relationships and circumstances that you're presently in. Mm -hmm. I very like this concept of um, faking anger, let's say. And I think I'm using it with my children. If I want to say something that this is important and they really need to do it now, come closer to me because they are too close to, to some trucks, for example, and it's dangerous. I'm using a, a stronger, louder voice and I don't feel any anger in, in my heart, but I want to give them the signal, this is serious. Let, let's treat this request serious. I think there is a plenty of uh, options that we can use this fake anger and my neighbor, if he heard my voice, he may think that I'm really angry at my children, but I don't have in my heart any uh, negative emotion at all. No, in fact, it's a, an act of love on your part. But you know they're just kids. And um, and that it's the way to get the message across. Now, unfortunately, we, we live in a world where some adults have never left their childhood. They're still, you know, they still respond to anger, but won't respond to reason. And then, uh, and this is uh, Seneca's line, you know, you put on a little show, you, you speak a language that they understand. Uh, and, uh, but uh, you're a fool if you uh, let yourself be angry as a result of, of what happened. Because if that happened, then that would mean you allowed a foolish person to ruin your day by making you angry. And the blame is on you if you let that happen. Mm -hmm. We mentioned uh, children. So I would like to ask you a question. If we believe as parents that stoicism is helpful for our life, should we encourage our children, our family, our friends to become stoics? Yeah, that's a tough question because I never, uh, well, in my books, I preach stoicism, I suppose I do, but but that's a voluntary thing, you know, and people can either take an interest or, or not. Uh, I have many friends who, if you ask them, uh, is, is, uh, is Bill Irvin a Stoic? They would say, what are you even talking about? Because it's not something I go around talking to people about. Sometimes I do give people um, Stoic advice, but without a, a big lecture. You know, like if somebody is um, has feels that they've been insulted, you know, and they describe the situation, I'll say, well, you know, shrug it off. That The person who insulted you is an idiot, and why are you letting an idiot wreck your day? Just It's like a, a barking dog, uh, so shrug it off, you know. Um, and sometimes that's effective. I don't know if, if uh, it always is. Another kind of aspect, another th question that, that, that's raised by, by teaching people to be Stoics. When I wrote uh, my first Stoic book, A Guide to the Good Life, uh, I guess I had the feeling that it was for old people. It was a philosophy where you needed to experience a lot of life and the disappointments life holds uh, before you would be in a position to uh, to enjoy, to truly appreciate Stoicism. I have since received lots of mail from people who are a college age and even younger who have uh, talked about uh, the beneficial role that Stoicism has played in their life. Now, you know, when it comes to teaching children, so I had two kids myself, uh, I think the best way to teach is by setting an example. And because uh, they will, you know, for a while there, you're a god, uh, the, the the person who knows everything and can do anything, and uh, they're gonna they're gonna be watching you and they're gonna be learning from you, and so you've got a chance when um, uh, life presents you with a setback to shrug it off, uh, and if they see you when uh, your your setback, if they see you playing the role of victim, they're gonna learn how to play the role of victim. 
So I'm not a child psychologist, but that, that would be the closest I could get um, giving advice on on a particular question. Uh, so you wait for teachable moments, and then you teach with your behavior. Uh, would, would be what I would say. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, how did your family feel about your decision to become a stoic? Has it changed your relationship with them? Uh, I think I was naturally, I'm what I call a congenital stoic. I think I've, I've kind of been uh, practicing stoicism at some level for all my life. But uh, my discovery of stoicism, all that did is it kind of formalized. I had a uh, vocabulary to go with it and describe uh, what I was doing. And of course, by reading um, the Stoics, who um, are quite accessible, uh, people like Marcus Aurelius, people like Seneca, uh, they're quite accessible you know, to modern readers. So a lot of times people think if it's a philosopher, it's going to be deep and mysterious and Um, they won't be able to understand it, but you can pick up the Roman Stoics and uh, you can understand uh, what they're saying. So as an adult, I mean, I learned a lot from reading uh, Stoics, um, and it has changed my approach to life. It has changed my, it probably has changed my relationships. I think I, I deal with anger a lot better than I used to. I think my ego uh, is still there, but not quite uh, the big ego that it used to be. <laughs> uh, I think I experience less envy than I used to. You know, I was, for a long time, I thought I was the only person on the planet who experienced feelings of envy, and I was shocked to find out that I was not alone. I've also started watching myself live, you know, so simultaneously I'm living, and I'm the spectator of my own life and watching how I respond to my circumstances and how I respond to setbacks. And uh, I, I also try to, to watch my own motives when I say something or do something. Uh, you know, later on, I'll think, okay, here's what I said during that conversation. What motivated it me to say what I did? Was it something good? Or was it a subtle put down? Was it the result of some kind of envy? So I've gotten more self-analytical. And, you know, some people would say, well, you shouldn't be, you should just be uh, natural. Except that if you do that, uh, the problem is that uh, that means you're putting these lower portions of your brain in control, your reptilian brain and your mam mammalian brain. They're going to they're gonna be the ones calling the shots. And that's one way to live. But uh, a lot of people who, who take that route end up with miserable... Uh, existences. Because remember, those portions of the brain evolved so you could thrive on the savannas of Africa uh, 200,000 years ago. We don't live in those times and in those circumstances anymore. Mm -hmm. You listed a lot of benefits to being a stoic, but is there a cost of being a stoic? Do we lose something by becoming a stoic? Um, let's see. So I'm a salesman for stoics, so I'm going to say, no, of course not. But here's Here's the thing. So it shouldn't be whether there's a cost. It should be to compare uh, the costs of various uh, approaches to life. So uh, Stoicism is an example of what I call um, philosophy for living or a philosophy of life. Uh, a lot of people don't have one, and there's a huge cost that comes with that. Uh, so that means they uh, keep trying the same things over and over and keep failing because the strategies for living they're using don't work. Why do they use them then? Because everybody else is using them. Surely that wouldn't be the case unless they worked. But in fact, in most cases, the other people who are using the strategy assume that somebody else has thought this through, when in fact nobody has. So most people, the default is to uh, seek fame and fortune. Fame means what? Means social status. Fortune means what? Means more money than the people around you. And the reason people want money is for the social status it'll bring. So it all kind of boils down to uh, social status. Um, so that's uh, one of the things is that if you aren't a Stoic, it's going to have a cost. Uh, you could mislive the one life you have to live. You could spend it pursuing things that aren't worth Uh, attaining. And you've only got one life. And, and isn't it a shame that you wasted it because you didn't invest 
the thought necessary to acquire a philosophy of life. Second um, thing uh, on that is if you look around at rival philosophies of life, so there was a time before I I stumbled across uh, Stoicism that I thought I wanted to be a Zen Buddhist. Uh, Zen Buddhism, uh, and this is not a put-down of Zen Buddhism, but uh, it's just got a, a lot higher entry fee than Stoicism does. If you want to become a serious practicing Zen Buddhist, you're going to have to spend months, years, decades practicing, uh, meditating, um, thinking, solving koans. You're, there's a whole bunch of stuff you're going to have to do, and there is no guarantee of success at the end of that. And of course, uh, a Zen Buddhist would say, well, what do you mean by success? So, it, But we aren't going to get into that conversation. <laughs> My claim is that um, Stoicism has a very low cost of entry. There's uh, about half a dozen uh, basic Stoic strategies. These are psychological strategies, and we've already talked about uh, two of them. We've talked about negative visualization, and we've talked about the last time meditation. Uh, last time meditation is where when you're doing something, you pause to consider that this might be the last time that you do it. Uh, so those are so easy to describe and so easy to give a test drive to. You can test them out and you can see the difference that they make in your life. And so uh, my standard line uh, is on a three-day weekend, and let me make sure your audience understands this. So in America, sometimes, uh, you know, with a holiday, we get a weekend and then we get Monday off as well, and that's called a three-day weekend. And my uh, standard sales pitch for Stoicism is that over a three-day weekend, you can learn everything you need to know about Stoicism to find out whether it's going to make a difference in your life or not. And that is, uh, you can um, read a book like, uh, you know, like My Guide to the Good Life, uh, or, or the Stoic Challenge is a more specialized version. Uh, you can try out, you, you can figure out what this, the um, um, psychological strategies are. You can try them out in your own life. And you will then know whether, wow, this really works. Or you might turn it, you might say, you know what, doesn't work for me. There are people who just seem to like anxiety. I, I don't know. So they aren't, they aren't natural born Stoics. It would take them some work. Um, so in other words, it's got a very low cost of entry and not going through the process of uh, adopting Stoicism or some rival philosophy of life is going to come at a huge cost. Uh, the, and, you know, in the worst terms, you might mislive the one life you have to live. You might spend that life doing pointless things because you mistakenly think they will get you ultimate happiness when in fact they don't. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges that we face today is technology, because on the one hand, it has a plenty of benefits. We can talk to each other because of this amazing technology. But on the other hand, we have some smartphone addictions, for example. I know that 2000 years ago, Roman Stoics didn't have laptops and smartphones, but maybe Stoics have some advices for us how to use technology wisely. Um, yeah, I've thought a lot about technology. So in America, uh, and I'm, I'm guessing this is true around the world, it, it's a, a major change, a sea change in uh, kind of the social realm. Um, so uh, online, you know, people can boast about their many friends and followers, uh, except that, uh, you know, a friend is what? The way I define a friend is somebody who, if your car breaks breaks down, um, you know, 20 miles out of town, you call the friend and the friend is there to help you <laughs> get back to town. That's a friend. Uh, whereas... Not necessarily a Facebook friend. <laughs> right, a Facebook friend, you know, they would say, we'll send pictures of the broken down car. Share those pictures. <laughs> um, so, um, and the other amazing thing, well, it's not amazing, I guess, once you, you realize it, is that... Um, it's easy to call somebody names when they aren't standing in front of you. And so, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, online, you just have these vicious attacks of people uh, that the, the person doing the attacking knows they'll never stand face to face. Uh, 
back before we had the internet, you knew if you did that to your neighbor, that neighbor would still be living next to you. It was a bad thing to do. So uh, we've gotten this uh, kind of level of hostility that in my lifetime uh, didn't exist. Another thing about the internet is it's a confirmation bias um, machine. So whatever it is you want to believe, you can find somebody online who will congratulate you for believing that. And so this whole notion of what what are what's the truth, what are the facts, has vanished into the background. Hey, you know, here's what I read, and somebody else read uh, something different. Uh, and uh, nuance, nuance in conversation has uh, has disappeared. Uh, so uh, you know, on on Twitter, you have a limited number of words you can use to express an idea, and so you you use those words or those characters to express the idea, and it comes out as a slogan. But most of the things in life that are worth thinking about will not be resolved with a slogan. It's going to be a nuanced. Well, you know, it depends. It's complex. Uh, a lot of people don't want to hear that. And then the last thought I've been having about that uh, is uh, I now refer to my cell phone as my dopamine slot machine. So dopamine is this drug that your brain releases uh, that makes you feel good. It's one of the feel-good drugs in your uh, brain. And uh, slot machine, of course, uh uh, uh, you know, you pull a handle and uh, you maybe you win some coins. And so if, you're, uh, if you carry around a cell phone, it'll make little sounds and you'll look and you'll see that somebody liked what you did. Uh, and uh, so the average person, I read this statistic, looks at their cell phone 160 times a day, just checking for these little um, positive reinforcement uh, mechanisms. And it's become a very strange thing. You'll be out on the street. You can be out in the street in a beautiful city like Paris, and you see people walking around looking down at their cell phones instead of, uh, instead of soaking in the environment. So uh, the Internet has... We're in the middle of a really interesting social experiment, and the experiment is what effect uh, will the Internet have on... Uh, on we humans and our happiness. Uh, I suspect it's going to be a, an experiment that has unfortunate outcomes. But uh, here we go. We're in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that maybe stoics can uh, help us with self-discipline. And we have even apps for doing it. Maybe it's a little bit weird to use technology against your technology addiction. But there is an application called Quality Time that counts how many unblocks of screens you made. And you can make yourself a challenge, not 160, but 100, then go, go down to uh, 50. And maybe this uh, self-control will help us to have benefits of technology, but enjoy life and don't stick to the phone all the time. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And there are apps that will... Uh, prompt you, will nudge you uh, through the day about uh, what you're doing and, and what you uh, could be doing. Uh, and uh, those uh, can be quite effective. Um, this, a stoic psychological insight, you know, self-control is, uh, the problem with self-control is it takes energy on your part. Uh, and uh, the things that are, tr the portions of your brain that are trying to get you to do something that you probably shouldn't do, that's the reptilian portion and the mammalian portion, they can't be reasoned with for the simple reason that they're incapable of reasoning. And they don't get tired. They're up all night, right? And they will wake you at one in the morning and tell you, here's something you should be angry about. Um, so one of the Stoic insights was... Um, uh, it's one thing to control uh, the urges brought on by these deeper forces within you, but they also thought uh, it's really neat if you can figure out a way to harness those forces and use them for the good. And so in this whole notion of uh, responding to a, uh, one of life's setbacks, that's what the Stoics have done. They've said, well, okay, so you can get upset about this, but you can also Play this game. Put it into a different frame. And imagine that these stoic gods are, are testing you. And imagine that you win the game by 
coming up with a successful workaround, good for you, and by staying cool and calm as you do so. And that's great for your uh, your mental health and your well-being. Mm-hmm. Great. I have some questions from my listeners. So Magda want to know, is happiness a competence that can be learned like cooking? If so, how can we learn to be happy? I'm not even sure what happiness is. And uh, one of the books I've written called On Desire uh, talks about happiness and happiness isn't an elusive thing. Um, So I think there are certain lifestyles you can live that are going to be more conducive to you experiencing this happiness, whatever it is. And there are other lifestyles you can uh, you can engage in that are, are going to make it less likely. So uh, it, it's a very, uh, very interesting and tricky thing, this notion of, of happiness. Uh, how do you be happy? Uh, one thing is you don't dwell on the past. You don't live in the future. You learn how to appreciate the current moment. Uh, another way to uh, get closer to happiness is learn how to want the things you've already got, because we have this this thing called uh, hedonic adaptation, where whatever it is you've got, you're going to start taking for granted. And then you're going to say, well, okay, I need something better than that. And you're going to be unhappy till you get it. And when you get it, you're going to be happy for a few days, and then you're going to be right back where you started. And uh, so there are psychological techniques. Uh, there's a podcast called The Happiness Lab. Um, and a, a, a Yale psychologist, a psychology professor named Lori Santos um, um, does, does this uh, class. And it's just about happiness and about the mistakes we make regarding happiness and things we can do to uh, increase our happiness. So uh, it's called The Happiness Lab. I was uh, on that podcast mm, last March, and I'm scheduled to be on again in the future talking about um, stoicism. But I've listened to many, many of her uh, podcasts and gained a lot of useful advice on what to do if we if we want to approach if we want to maximize our chances of experiencing happiness. Mm-hmm, great. So I will put a link to this podcast and maybe my okay. listeners can enjoy it too. Charlene asks, what do you do to find or keep happy during the time of COVID-19? Um, well, I'm a writer. I'm a teacher and a writer. And so back in March, they said that uh, we were no longer going to teach in classrooms. So Uh, I had to learn the new technology to uh, teach online. But other than that, my time is spent uh, writing and doing research. So the the interesting thing was most of my life is spent uh, in my office at home working. And so for me, the pandemic and the lockdown that followed it simply meant all my neighbors were doing what I was doing. So for me, it wasn't a, a uh, a huge transition. Uh, and at the same time, you know, I realized that for a lot of people, I, it wasn't simply staying home. It was the loss of a job, uh, you know, and in some cases there were the health issues and, some, of course, some people uh, died as a result. Um, but as a Stoic, uh, you know, I can find the silver lining in this because those of us who make it through to the other side – Uh, this has simply taught us not to take things in life for granted. And it shows the extent to which we did. So you now, um, you know, now they're trying to get sports going again. And so they have people playing matches in empty stadiums, right? Uh, theater has gone away. Uh, symphony has gone away. We took those things for granted. And this is just the kick in the pants that we needed in order, if we do get them back, to savor them, to embrace them, to uh, to uh, take them as something very valuable in our life. So, so in a way, a, a good thing can come out of this. Uh, but the Stoics would quickly kind of remind us that, yeah, and then hedonic adaptation will set in once again. <laughs> and within a few months, we'll be right back where we were taking it all for granted. Oh, well. Or we have a second wave of COVID-19. 
Yep. Our third wave. I think we're already on the second. Mm-hmm. I'm losing count here. But uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, that's a scary thing. This is summer. Wait till we're, it's winter and we're all enclosed indoors. Uh, so we live in interesting t- times, my friend. <laughs> Tomek asks, what would you do if you realize that you have three last hours of your life? I would uh, find my wife and, uh, and hang out with her, uh, call my kids, uh, hang out with them. Uh, it would be nice to go into your final moments, happy individual, and realizing that in uh, the process of death, there's one Stoic that I describe who was uh, sentenced to die, uh, Julius Canis, I think was the one, and uh, as he was being led off to his execution... Um, somebody came up and said, well, you're a Stoic, so what are you thinking about now? And he said, oh, well, I'm going to pay very careful attention to the moment when my soul leaves my body to see what that feels like, because I've always wondered what that feels like, and now I get to see what that feels like. You know, talk about the ability to find silver linings on dark clouds, but what else could he do? You know, what else could he do? Uh, So to die uh, bravely and, you know, this whole notion about treating life setbacks as stoic training. One of the ways you can take that is you're in training for the ultimate test, and that is your own death, which is going to come someday. Sometimes people die in their sleep. You know, they didn't know it, didn't see it coming. Other times it's a long, unpleasant uh, kind of experience. But uh, but it will come. And, and this idea that by learning how to grapple with life setbacks, you can, you can end your life with a courageous and even inquisitive state of mind. You can, instead of um, being the victim, you can be ch- trying to cheer up the people around you. And I think that would be the ideal way to go. Mm-hmm. Great answer. I have just two last questions. Have the Stoic Gods prepared any interesting challenge for you lately? Well, minor challenges. You know, the whole uh, epidemic is a challenge, although for me, uh, less of a challenge than normally is. So lately, uh, I've been... Um, I have self-inflicted challenges, uh, so uh, I'm a rower, uh, and we no longer uh, race on the water, so we have these machines, these rowing machines called ergs, and I, uh, I've entered a, an erg competition, and it's amazing. We do these four-minute races, and over the course of the four minutes, you go from feeling absolutely fine to feeling <laughs> like you have some dread disease. Uh, and, you know, somebody can rationally say, why would I do such a thing? Well, it's training. You know, it's training and you're you're in there and then you, you finish the first minute, you know, and you think only three to go. Uh, you finish uh, the, the first three minutes, only one minute to go. And then you're counting down and you, you, you just keep saying to yourself, I need to take one more stroke, one more stroke. That's a skill that translates to life in general. And that's a skill you want to possess because you can get very, very far in life if you have the ability to take one more step, one more stroke, uh, you know, just do you keep going until you can't go anymore. Mm hmm. I'm using this technique of voluntary discomfort described in your book. So, for example, in this month, I don't drink coffee at all. Previous month, I didn't drink alcohol for a whole month. And it really changes my perspective. It really helped me enjoy much more this uh, food, this beverage the next month. The first time when I can drink coffee is just a gigantic pleasure for me. And I yep. took it for granted. So this one month of being abstinent in this uh, helped me really enjoy this part of my life. Yeah, I've had uh, back in January, I had a uh, doctor say for medical reasons, he said no more alcohol. Uh, now, I wasn't a big drinker, but uh, I was a person who enjoyed a glass of wine. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing was, uh, when that happened, you know, for me, I was just, well, that's a stoic challenge. Let's see what I do with that. Uh, it has transformed my sleep life. I realize now that, you know, if you drink, drink something else to go back to sleep, and it's this vicious circle that feeds on itself, 
Um, but now I find I'm, I'm sleeping much better and I'm just having the most vivid dream life. You know, I have just wild stuff, interesting stuff. And I'm thinking, you know, my brain makes all that up while I'm asleep. And of course, it's the lower part of my brain. So I get to peek into the sorts of things that it, uh, it thinks about. Um, so, uh, yeah, involuntary. So for me, the, the racing is involuntary discomfort. I know how I'm going to feel four minutes later, and then I do it anyway. And, uh, uh, it, it builds character. You know, it prepares you for the serious kinds of uh, challenges that life can present. I have just one last question for you. Do you have any connections with Poland? Maybe you have eaten pierogi or bigos? No, I have no Polish connections. I, I You know, we were, uh, well, we've reached a stage of life where we've been doing a whole bunch of traveling, but <laughs> have had to stop uh, traveling, you know, because I'm over 65, as is my wife. And so, you know, we are in a risk group, and I certainly don't want to get in an airplane. Uh, but Poland would be on the list. And, and then there's China, and we were scheduled to go to Japan this this May. And Ah, there's a great big world out there to be discovered. But yeah, Poland, nope, no connection. Uh, in a perfect world, I will someday make one, though. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. A lot of insights for me and my listeners. It was a pleasure for me. Oh, it was a pleasure for me as well. Thank you for inviting me.